reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, it is widely reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of a kind not found even among pagans, a man living with his father's wife, and you are inflated with pride. Should you not rather have been sorrowful, the one who did this deed should be expelled from your midst. I, for my part, although absent in body, but present in spirit, have already, as at present, pronounced judgment on the one who has committed this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus. When you have gathered together, and I, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not appropriate. Do you know? Do you not know that a little yeast leavens all the dough? Clear out the old yeast, so that you may become a fresh batch of dough, and as much as you are unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Verum Domini. Lead me in your justice, Lord. For you, O God, delight not in wickedness. No evil man remains with you. The arrogant may not stand in your sight. You hate all evildoers. You destroy all who speak falsehood. The bloodthirsty and the deceitful, the Lord abhors. But let all who take refuge in you be glad and exult forever. Protect them that you may be the joy of those who love your name. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Luca. On a certain Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him closely to see if he would cure on the Sabbath, so that they might discover a reason to accuse him. But he realized their intentions and said to the man with the withered hand, come up and stand before us. And he rose and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than to do evil, to save life, rather than to destroy it? Looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. 
But they became enraged and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. Verbum Domini. Today's gospel continues the dilemma between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees over the Sabbath law and what it is to entail, that is, what may be done on the Sabbath and what may not be done on the Sabbath. In the last weekday gospel, which we did not hear, because that would have been Saturday of the 22nd week in ordinary time, and this year, that day was the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin, but had we have heard the gospel of that day, we would have heard that Jesus and his disciples are questioned as to their supposed laboring in the grain fields while at the same time eating because they are hungry. They are accused of breaking the Sabbath rest while picking ears of corn or snapping off the heads of wheat and eating them. And in today's gospel, Jesus, knowing these thoughts of the scribes and Pharisees regarding the Sabbath, the very teachers of the law, keep in mind, He questions them. Jesus questions the scribes and the Pharisees if whether or not it's lawful to cure on the Sabbath, or is this also to be considered laborious work and therefore prohibited? You know, it's proof of Jesus' divinity because we're told at the beginning of today's gospel that we just heard proclaimed that they're talking among themselves and they're thinking, uh, is he going to cure or not? What's he going to do? Is he going to do this or not? And then we're told in the very next line, masterfully by Luke, Jesus knowing their thoughts, their interior thoughts. That's proof of Jesus is what? His divinity. Yeah, he's God. He's the second person of the Trinity. And what does Jesus masterfully do? He says to the man with the withered hand, stand up and come here. It's very dramatic. Very, very dramatic. It's on a Sabbath, which is made very, very clear to us. And keep in mind, too, that today's gospel literally takes place inside the Jewish synagogue, that is, the Jewish church house, as it were, the literal and legitimate place of worship. In other words, this didn't take place in the market square. This didn't take place in a a field just outside of town. This whole drama unfolds, per se, inside the church house, the place of worship. That's very, very significant because Jesus is showing his authority as the God-man in a definitive place of worship. It's also where Jesus gave the famous bread of life discourse in John chapter 6 inside the church house, the synagogue. So it really is rather very dramatic here, this scene. You have the Lord of the Sabbath questioning the law of the Sabbath to the very teachers of that law in the very synagogue in regards to a miraculous cure about to take place. Fasten your seatbelts. Do those pews have seatbelts? About a third of you just went like this to look. Very dramatic scene. St. Augustine, in his famous work, City of God, tells us, the Pharisees do not want to reply to Jesus' question when he questions them and do not know how to react to the miracle when he goes on to work it. It should have converted the scribes and Pharisees, but their hearts are in darkness. Who's the father of darkness? Satan, the devil. Their hearts are in darkness, and they are full of jealousy and anger towards Jesus, St. Augustine says. And so they keep quiet in the Lord's presence and begin to discuss him among themselves, not with a view to approaching him again about his teachings, but rather with the purpose of killing him. What are we going to do with him? is how the gospel ends today. And in the same regard, kind of echoing Augustine, St. Cyril of Jerusalem comments, O Pharisee, you see him working wonders and healing the sick in your midst by using a higher power, yet out of envy you still plot his death. 
Envy is one of the seven capital sins. O Pharisee, you see him working wonders and healing the sick in your midst by using a higher power, yet out of envy you still plot his death. Although Jesus, of course, is gentle and humble of heart, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, he boldly confronted the religious leaders of his time. Huh? The scribes and Pharisees were furious because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Jesus could have healed on another day, a non-Sabbath day, in another inconspicuous way, not such an important restoration of a withered hand, and he could have even done it in another place, someplace more secular, like the marketplace. But he did not. Instead, he commanded the man with the withered hand to stand up in front of everyone in the synagogue per se, the divine place of worship, and then healed him in the very midst of all those present. Again, the religious leaders of the day reacted to this confrontation with frenzied plots against Jesus, we're told, in Luke 6, verse 11 in today's gospel. And like Jesus, St. Paul, in today's first reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, strongly confronted the man guilty of doing what? Living with his father's wife. St. Paul calls him out in his sin for living with his father's wife. St. Paul announced in the first readings this morning, I, for my part, have already pronounced judgment on the one who has committed this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So Paul's doing this in a medicinal way to actually save the man. Okay? Remember, we have a right to judge objectively a situation as it appears to us. But subjective judgment, of course, is left to God because we don't know where the person's at interiorly. Maybe this man was never preached about how it's wrong to live in a presumably active sexual relationship with your stepmother, your father's wife. Maybe he was never catechized in that regard. So we leave the subjective judgment to God, but Paul has a right to judge the situation objectively. Again, St. Paul does it medicinally, huh? I, for my part, have already pronounced judgment, he says, on the one who has committed this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So we also are called to boldly confront sin, both in ourselves, we're all fallen, and in others. But when confronting sin in others, we do it, of course, objectively. After cleansing our own temples, Luke 19, 45, we must unequivocally call sin what it is, sin. We must abhor sin while loving sinners and calling them to the truth, capital T. In other words, confront Satan, confront self, and confront sin, and confront others objectively, informing them about their objective sin how it looks, how it seems to be objectively, all the while growing in self-knowledge yourself and becoming a great evangelizer of the faith. You know, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, my friends, there's a very telling paragraph that reminds us of four categorical consequences to sin. Personal, social, ecclesial, and cosmic consequences to sin. Paragraph 1469, quoting Pope St. John Paul II's 1984 Apostolic Exhortation on Reconciliation and Penance, tells us the following regarding the wonderful effects of the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, holy confession. Number 1469 of the Catechism, quoting St. John Paul II in his 1984 Apostolic Exhortation on Reconciliation and Penance. Listen to this. It must be recalled that this reconciliation offered from the sacrament of penance and thus with God leads, as it were, to other reconciliations which repair the other breaches caused by sin. The forgiven penitent is reconciled with himself. Personal, huh? In his inmost being, he is reconciled, where he regains his innermost truth. He is reconciled with his brethren, social consequences of sin. 
he is reconciled with his brethren, whom he has in some way offended and wounded. He is reconciled with the church, ecclesial, huh? and he is reconciled with all creation, cosmic. So there's four categorical consequences to sin whenever we commit a sin, personal, social, ecclesial, and cosmic. But the sacrament of reconciliation, holy confession, helps reconcile those four breaches, personal, social, ecclesial, and cosmic, by leading to four reconciliations in those same four categories. Huh? As such, we can say that there are four categorical consequences to every sin committed. Again, personal, social, ecclesial, and cosmic. In other words, each and every sin committed by an individual whether venial or mortal, affects that individual personally, for example, by restricting growth in personal virtue, socially, by somehow affecting his relationship with others, ecclesially, wherein the whole body of Christ, the church, is somehow disrupted, and cosmically, just read chapter 3 of the book of Genesis to discover how the very cosmos, creation itself, is affected by the sin of our first parents. The beautiful garden closes in on itself, huh? And because you have done this, O oh man, from henceforth you will toil by the sweat of your brow. And because you have done this, O oh woman, from henceforth you shall give birth with the pangs of labor. So the cosmic consequences of sin. Chapter 3 in Genesis. The good news, however, and this is very, very important, is that these four areas of disruption, these four breaches caused by sin can be repaired and healed through the sacrament of reconciliation because of Almighty God's divine intervention, His forgiveness, and His mercy. But it's the third of these categorical consequences that I'd like to focus on here and end this homily with. The ecclesial disruption caused by sin. The ecclesial breach caused by sin. Huh? And this during a time of particularly egregious church scandal. As Christians, we know that sin is always a personal act. Even though it might be carried out with another, as in the case of adultery, it's carried out with another. Or with others, in the plural, like a group of people robbing a bank. Regardless of that, whether it's carried out with another or others, sin is always, always a personal choice, a personal act. In fact, the church has always defined sin not only as an offense against God, but also an offense against truth and a person's own reason and right conscience. So sin is always a personal choice, even though it might be carried out with another or with others. Still, the catechism makes clear that the good news is that the church herself benefits from her members individually receiving the sacrament of penance. Again, this is important to recall at a time when we are dealing with particularly egregious church scandal and seek a sound and lasting remedying and healing of the situation. Huh? Paragraph 1469 states, again, same paragraph, this sacrament of reconciliation reconciles us with the church. In this sense, it does not simply heal the one restored to the ecclesial communion, but it actually has a revitalizing effect on the life of the church herself, which suffered from the sin of one of her members. Wow. So not only does the individual who sinned benefit from the sacrament of penance, the church herself benefits from my confession. The church is revitalized because of my returning to the sacrament of penance. Amen? amen? That sounds like an amen that hasn't had coffee yet. <laughs> the church is revitalized by my confession. Amen? amen? This sacrament of reconciliation, again, reconciles us with the church. True enough. The sinner is reconciled with the church. In this sense, however, it does not simply heal the one restored to ecclesial communion, but also has a revitalizing effect on the life of the church, 
which suffered herself from the sin of one of her members. So the church herself benefits from her members going to confession. And while the church's current crisis involving clerics and their superiors is one that rightly puts clerics and their superiors in the spotlight, there is a much bigger picture that needs to be examined to help solve that crisis as in a very, very important one among others. The old saying that no man is an island unto himself is aptly applied here. In other words, everything that each one of us does, whether cleric or lay member, is somehow interconnected with that big picture. In other words, each one of us can say, my sins do not affect just me. Amen. My sins, my personal sins, do not affect just me. Because there are personal, social, ecclesial, and cosmic consequences to my sin. But the good news is, the sacrament of penance helps restore those four breaches caused within those four categorical consequences of sin. As the Catechism states in paragraph 1039, in a section on the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, quote, the last judgment will reveal even to its furthest consequences the good that each person has done or failed to do during his earthly life. The last judgment will reveal even to its furthest consequences the good that each person has done or failed to do during his earthly life. We don't commit sin in a vacuum. My personal sin does not affect just me. With these profound truths in mind, we can begin to discern not only how clerical abuse has played its major part in contributing to the ecclesial consequences of personal sin, but how the following crises, in the plural, concerning the laity have as well. For example, only 39% of Catholics attend Mass on Sunday. Some statistics put it as low as 25% only attend Mass on Sunday, a holy day of obligation. And this even before the scandals were exposed. It was already that low, even before the scandals were exposed. 82% huh? of Catholics view contraceptives as morally acceptable. 49% of Catholics believe that abortion should be permissible in some circumstances. 50% of Catholics practice cohabitation before marriage. 68% of Catholics approve of so-called gay marriage. And only 2% of Catholics go to confession regularly. Only 2% of Catholics go to confession regularly, identified as once a month or better. Clearly, we are experiencing the ecclesial consequence of sin. We're in the body of Christ, the church herself is disrupted. Again, no man is an island unto himself. We are all somehow, some way interconnected in what we do vicefully. And there are ecclesial consequences because of it. But the good news is, my friends, we are also interconnected in what we do virtuously. Amen? Amen. We are also interconnected in what we do virtuously. And returning to the sacrament of reconciliation, confession is one such virtuous act. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Our Lady of Akita, St. Joseph, terror of demons. Our own individual guardian angels and patron saints. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you all and again welcome to all of our pilgrims.